Starting off with the with the uh, the first introduction to uh, embankment dam design, I'm I'm going to try to set the stage for the, for the rest of the course. So, and again, you know, please feel free to interject and interact. That's why we have exercises in here, so you don't listen to us the whole time. But it, we we have a pretty good range of experience. In fact, I just wanted to, if we went and did introductions, one thing I I forgot to just mention that we have, we have a little over 70% of the people are from the core. You probably got that impression when we went around the room. 20% from consultants. We have one from a state agency and um, one person from uh, academia. So, uh, and we have kind of a wide range of experience as you heard from about four months to a little over 30 years. So we have a pretty wide array of people in the room. So, um, even people that don't have as much experience, I certainly encourage you to, to interact and, uh, and make this kind of a better session all the way around. So the overall course objectives, we're gonna talk components of embankment dams, uh, dam failure modes, and, the, and their importance in design. Um, we're gonna look at site geology and site characterization and evaluate that. And we're gonna go through some of the analysis on more of a high level, but go through them to have, to have you understand what is required to, to do both modification and a new embankment dam design for settlement, seepage stability, filter compatibility, and seismic evaluations. Um, looking at some critical embankment uh, dam details, we're gonna show a lot of typical cross sections of embankment dams, as well as foundation design and instrumentation. Look through some construct construction considerations and of course the case histories I just talked about. So that was, that was the objectives of the entire course. So for this introduction, the objectives of this introduction, I wanted to go over some general guidelines on laying out uh, embankment dams, because this is, a, this is, to me, it's about final design, put together plan specifications, cost estimates, you know, for, uh, for an embankment uh, design. Go through the elements of a embankment design, potential failure modes, Again, we're going to show typical cross sections of earth fill and rock fill uh, embankments, as well as uh, uh, some factors to identify and to select uh, the proper embankment cross section, and then end with design and construction factors. So, starting off with some general recommendations on dam design, you want to use uh, proven details and um, and precedents. Uh, for, for any dam design, and that almost goes with almost anything that you would design. But I have a set of drawings and details that I've collected over the years. A reclamation has an entire book of all their details that they've used throughout the various decades that I think is generally publicly available. But you, for me, I wanna start off with a design that is somewhat similar to what I'm working on that has gone through construction, that's been construction proven. Um, the orientation of the, of the plan view, the general state of practice is that you look at it, the, the dam looking downstream. So if you're standing on the dam crest, the right abutment's on your right, the left abutment's on your left. That may sound pretty simple, but I've, I know of a case that, that there was some drilling work that was going to be done uh, on a particular dam. And, and then the plan view was looking upstream instead of downstream. And they were getting ready to mobilize to the right abutment. And then the drilling work had to uh, be performed on the left abutment. So somebody had caught that, but they were looking upstream instead of downstream. So it may sound pretty simple, but it can be pretty confusing. If you don't, if you just simply remember, it's always looking in a downstream direction. Because that, that plan view is gonna, can be used and should be used through uh, operations and maintenance manuals, EAPs, if an emergency occurs and there's something on the right abutment, you don't want to say, is that looking upstream or downstream? It's always looking downstream. Um, and north, the direction of north doesn't really matter because it's all about your right and left abutment, again, looking downstream. The sequence of drawings, you put a drawing package together. I've worked on a lot of designs over the years. It's usually, it's in a logical sequence of what the drawings are put together. Usually existing conditions, some geologic cross sections. And I always like to include a plan of general modifications 
which is really a roadmap to the rest of the set. It will highlight details and where to find other details, whether it's embankment or a spillway. Um, then you have demolition, excavation uh, plans and sections. And then I, I always like to separate it up into packages, an embankment package, if there's a spillway or an outlet works. So it's all in logical sequence. It's not just for the reviewers, but for the bidders as well. So the set should be really uh, very self-explanatory and not be confusing when they put it all together. And then you end with some miscellaneous details. Um, and that's usually the, the logical way to, to, for me, to put the set together. So I look at just the, the typical sequence for, for a design, you put usually 30, 60, 90% submittals, and then your final. So if I look at something around the 30%, 35% set that you're submitting, it, it should include plan profile and cross sections, enough detail that you can take a, a, a good cost estimate off on it, quantity takeoff, uh, as well as providing enough detail to reviewers that they understand what your concept is, and again, enough to take quantities off on. Uh, Excavation plans, I always like to put an excavation plan in. It gives the contractor the overall plan view of, of uh, what the, the depth and extent of the excavation is. And on cross sections, I think one of the major points on cross sections, and again, it's a standard detail, is water always flows from left to right. So on a cross section, the water is always on the left. I, I reviewed a set not too long ago that within the same set, they flipped the cross section. So in, in one sheet, they showed cross sections of water going from right to left, and the other sections, they were from left to right, which to me is really confusing. So um, the standard of the industry is water is always on the left, and it's to true scale as well. So exaggerated scales, I've, I've certainly worked um, exaggerated scales. I've seen you know, on some sets over the years, um, you, you typically, you, 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 show, you show enough cross sections that you have a full understanding of how to construct the project, but you don't usually cut them every 50 feet like you would in the highway design and then show those. Because I've seen that happen before where people put, um, they have no call outs, no dimensions on any of those cross sections, and they have no value whatsoever. You, you can't, and then it's misleading because of an exaggerated scale, it looks like something that is a, is a three horizontal to one slope now looks like it's one to one slope. So uh, I would not use the exaggerated scales on cross section. There is a place for exaggerated scales, but not for embankment cross sections. So this is just a typical um, plan view here of an embankment dam. Let's see if I can get my little cursor to work here. There we go. So you can see the, the, the right abutment, right abutment is here, left abutment is here, here's the embankment dam, flow is going up off the top of the page, and you see north arrow is just kind of pointing at wherever it points. So that's kind of the, the general orientation. And this is a, a cross section of a, of a dam that I was uh, the, the lead geotech on some years ago. But again, you can see that the reservoir is on the left right here. And then the other thing to kind of point out that there's other details that are shown, you know, in a couple different places here on this uh, on this cross section because there's, there's so many details. You don't want to clog up a drawing. You want it to be something that it can easily be followed by by bidders and reviewers. So you you call out some additional details to to show on other sheets. So I know this is a a review for several of you that are. Have a lot of experience, but um, hopefully you'll um, maybe you'll have something to add to some of these discussions. But I want to start off with the elements of an uh, embankment dam. So first, you have a water barrier. So here we have the core of the dam, and we have a cutoff trench that goes that cuts off some probably more alluvial deposit here that could have uh, seepage concerns underneath the dam. And then on the upstream and downstream of that more impervious core, you have upstream and downstream shells. So the upstream and downstream shells are typically more pervious and stronger than the core itself, because the core would be more clay, 
Um, so it's it, it's fairly impervious, but it doesn't have as much strength. And the upstream and downstream shell material will support that core. Then we have filters and drains, just to make sure we're all in the same terminology. So you have, you typically would put a, this is the chimney, Jane, right here. And then connected to that is a, is a blanket, Jane. So the chimney has both a filter, typically, that is right adjacent to the core, and then a stone layer that is a chimney drain um, right next to the filter. And then we would have a filter on the, on the foundation and then a drain on top of that. So any seepage that comes through the embankment would be that enters into this chimney would then flow into the blanket and then into some collection system into a tow drain system. Structural support of the entire embankment, of course, is really critical. So we don't, we're going to talk a lot about cracking of embankment dams um, as, as one of the failure modes that can lead to a failure. So uh, certainly foundation support to make sure you don't have differential settlement of your embankment is, is really critical. Foundation preparation, particularly underneath the core. So right here on your foundation, let's say it's a rock foundation, uh, the, the preparation of the rock and discontinuities in the rock and shear zones become really critical to make sure that uh, we don't create a failure mode. And then with any embankment dam design, we wanna concentrate our design on failure modes that have been typical in the past for embankment dams and not create any new failure modes. So with this introduction, I just, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, historic failure rates of embankment dams. So here's a plot of annual probability of failure. That's what the APS stands for here. And that's versus consequences of failure. And that is, and this plot is lives lost. So you can see that on this plot, here's US dams plotted down here. And in the kind of the typical range of life's loss, it's one dam failure in 10,000 dams per year. So one times 10 to the minus four is kind of a, a, a range that several different people have evaluated over time. And that is, that's about the failure rate um, of embankment dams. And in fact, embankment dams still fail today in the US. There was a uh, Lake Bella Vista Dam failed in 2021 in Arkansas. Uh, two dams in Michigan had failed back in 2020 and Spencer Dam in Nebraska in uh, 2019. So th those failures still occur, occur today. And just wanted to look at some other, oh yeah. So in a, in a, in a 170 year period, from 1848 to 2017, there was over 1,600 dams that failed in the U.S. as well. So I think the importance is they still fail today. We do, we're trying to, of course, lower that number by looking at failure modes, what the typical failure modes are. And for anybody that designs embankments, you should look at historical failures that have occurred to make sure that you, uh, you, you uh, have lessons learned from them. So, to talking about uh, potential failure modes, um, I'm going to just give a very quick overview of, of uh, potential failure modes. There is uh, USACE and the, and the Risk Management Center hosts um, specific courses on, on failure modes. Uh, one of them, Adam had, uh, has gone through uh, the best practices and risk assessments for dams and levees. That's a, that's a week-long course that was held three times this past year. Um, so it's, uh, it's going to be held again, probably sometime next year, not sure when. And then there's specific courses at the RMC host as well on internal erosion. So I'm going to not spend a lot of time. We have a whole lot to cover in the course, but, um, internal erosion, there can be, uh, four general methods, uh, of, uh, of internal erosion, uh, backward erosion, piping, concentrated leak erosion, suffusion, suffusion as well as uh, soil contract erosion. Uh, overtopping failures are always have to be evaluated for embankment dam, embankment dams that are not protected with some kind of protective cover will fail very rapidly if they overtop. There's seismic failure modes and, and static instability as well. So a little bit about 
backward erosion piping. So it's one of the more common uh, failure modes. In fact, when you look at all internal failure modes, uh, internal erosion failure modes, they account for about half of the incidents and failures of embankment dams. So that's one that you have to become really familiar with um, for internal erosion for all these failure modes as far as designing embankments. So backward erosion piping, it starts with erosion and particle displacement near a seepage exit point, and it begins to backward erode or, or erode towards the source of water, which would be the reservoir. And while it's doing that, it creates a pipe or a, uh, uh, an, an erosion tunnel underneath the embankment. And it, while, well, while it does that, as it approaches the, the pool itself, that seepage length becomes shorter and shorter. So the likelihood of it progressing becomes greater and if it progresses enough further upstream, you could collapse your embankment, have slope instability, and breach your dam. So very critical um, aspect. So for backward erosion piping, we have a couple of common uh, areas where they occur. It's this, say, this, uh, this shell material um, that could um, erode into a, so a finer shell into a, say, a a coarser gravel deposit can have a finer grain core into again, maybe this alluvial deposit, the core into the downstream shell, and then associated with, the, with an outlet with the penetration through the embankment. Now scour or also called concentrated leak erosion really is a, a, a crack that is formed in the embankment is kind of a typical way to describe it. And if the pool rises up to where that crack is, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the particles along the edge of the crack, if your forces are high enough, it can start to move particles along that crack. And the particles have to be, um, have enough velocity to transport them downstream. And they also has to have a unfiltered exit uh, for, for, the, um, for the concentrated leak erosion to occur. Um, Locations where concentrated leak erosion occurs, can it be associated with the outlet? Um, can be a flaw through the embankment, and that could be uh, caused by uh, winter shutdown, particularly back here in the Northeast. Um, it can be um, associated with uh, poorly blending the material coming out of a boro area. So you put, unintentionally, a, a sandier deposit was put uh, through a layer through the embankment. Uh, the, the next is a transverse crack, this 5A, that's, that would be upstream and downstream, and that could be caused by desiccation cracking, can be caused by embankment deformation, uh, seismic loading can cause that crack, and also a, a transverse crack that could go around your abutment. And there's also soil contact erosion that I'll cover here in a second. So just very briefly, suffusion and suffusion, if I start out at a initial time, um, and then first I should say that these deposits are internally unstable deposits to create suffusion or suffusion. They have a, uh, a, a really a gap graded material, have a, a coarse grain uh, deposit as well as fines. And after some period of time with flow in this, in this direction, so flow down the page, those fines will wash out between those coarse grains. Um, and then what happens is additional grains will flow, will flow through um, the, uh, the deposit as well. And this is just a view looking in the other direction with flow horizontally. Now soil uh, contact erosion is uh, this figure, this on the left-hand side, if you had a coarser like open work gravel deposit and you had a fine grain material up above it, with flow in the horizontal direction, it could draw those fines into that open work gravel, and then those fines would, uh, uh, would be transported downstream. And this is the same, except for the coarse grain is above the fine grain, it could draw those fine grains up and be deposited uh, downstream, which could cause a deformation uh, and an internal erosion failure mode. For embankment overtopping, the, the uh, what I'm showing on the left-hand side is kind of the typical view for a cohesive, uh, a homogeneous cohesive embankment, where, where if it did overtop, 
because of the cohesive nature of the material, you get some very steep um, faces that are forming. On cohesion lifts, again, due to the nature of the cohesion lift material, it would be a much smoother surface when it would fail. And in reality, with our zoned embankments, remember the first one that I showed that had a clay core and had shell material, you'd get some combination of this uh, in reality if you were to overtop. Seismic failure modes, this top figure is a flow slide, um, and it actually, it, uh, it, it flowed below, you lost freeboard, so you're now below the uh, reservoir pool, and you see you just have a little remnant left, which probably isn't going to last too long. It will probably fail then by internal erosion. The, the middle figures are transverse cracks, that again could be from a seismic loading, and the issue there is you have cracks on the, say, upstream and downstream shoulder, and now your seepage length between those is very short. So then you can get an internal failure mode, internal erosion failure mode caused by that. The, the lower figures are, are a uh, transverse crack, which is very problematic. Again, that's a concentrated leak erosion that could occur. Static instability. I wanted to point out that this photo is of uh, Fort Peck Dam. Uh, a core dam that failed catastrophically during construction in 1938. Um, it was, it was uh, loaded very rapidly, so there was excess pore pressures that were generated, and this whole failure area itself was about 160 acres, so it, it was a massive slide that occurred. This is just a couple of photos of some, some relatively recent core projects where we had instability, with just within the embankment, it didn't encompass the foundation. Um, and there was actually some desiccation cracking associated with these failures. Now, Amanda is going to go through all the, the different load cases that we have to cover for, for stability analysis of an embankment. So I'm not going to bother to, to go through them here, but I, I listed them here just to kind of for completeness. So um, Wanted to, to show you a typical cross section of an embankment dam. And the first thing I want to say is that it would be highly unusual if you had all of these components on one cross section. But it's easy to talk about some, some measures or features that you would have uh, for an embankment cross section. But I don't know if I've ever seen this many features on one. It's going to be a lot of problems to have them all on one. But, but at the point of this is I want to talk about seepage reduction. Uh, features as well as um, seepage control features. So seepage reduction features are usually the ones from, from uh, the midpoint or so to the upstream side. So in this case, I have an impervious blanket is a seepage reduction feature, and that would lengthen the seepage path underneath the embankment. So that would be a more impervious uh, material. And then the clay core and the cutoff are seepage reduction um, features, as well as this cutoff wall that extends down into some much more impervious deposit, probably into a bedrock. Now, the seepage reduction features here are, are the uh, chimney drain and uh, chimney filter, as well as the blanket drain and filter uh, and the tow drain system. And then the, uh, uh, the deeper trench drains, and, and these these are used, actually there, uh, there's two different core projects that are using deeper trench drains that are under design right now. Uh, and that is for uh, uh, backward erosion piping when you have a deeper, thicker deposit. Uh, relief wells, they're used a lot on levees, but there's also uh, several core dams that have relief wells. Then you have a seepage stability berm. And again, it's a seepage reduction. And then this filter right here, this uh, on the downstream side of your trench. And then again, this is for internal erosion protection. If you had uh, a material here that that fine grain core could then erode into say a more open work deposit. So I'm gonna go through um, a few quick slides and showing some, some very basic cross sections of embankment dams. Um, so this first one is an impervious fill, and for high hazard dams, this would not be recommended. There's no filters associated with this. There's no protection from internal erosion. Next, we have a combination. We have an impervious fill in a, in a shell material. And um, I was just gonna ask the group, so why, why is this not recommended for a high hazard dam? 
Is there anything that you see that's missing from this cross section? Anybody want to venture a guess? Oh, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I heard filters. So, yep, filters. So there's no blanket filter. There's no chimney drain. So you have highly fractured rock, and, and you have this rock foundation, which you could create an internal erosion uh, mechanism through that. So filters is exactly right. And you're going to hear filters and drains so many times that if you walk away from here, the only thing you remember is something about filters and drains. I think we did our job because that's that's one of the most critical aspects of any embankment is to um, to stop that failure mode from internal erosion, as I talked about. Now we have another cross section. Hey, we've got filters. It, they look kind of funny here. And then a rock fill toe. And then for this case, you don't have a chimney here. And then this is, you have no blanket. So if your, your, um, your phreatic surface could intersect above where this filter is, and then you're not protecting this area of the foundation. Here's another case that just has a blanket on the foundation. There's actually quite a few dams that were built in like the uh, the the um, uh, 50s and 60s that have this exact case. And again, this does not have does not have a chimney, and there's a little bit of a blanket that's not protected as well. So here's a case that um, this is a cross section that has been used on high hazard dams. So you have a, a vertical chimney. Uh, and filter uh, connected to a blanket, then you have this uh, filter as well to protect that uh, cutoff. Also have what's called a central core. So you have your more clay core uh, center, and then downstream you have your chimney filter first, which is a sand, uh, a, a, uh, like a half inch minus stone that's adjacent to it. Uh, and then say a rock fill shell. Well, you need a transition zone in between those uh, for filter compatibility because you have say half inch stone and you've got rock that may be uh, on the order of, uh, let's say uh, 18 inch size maximum rock. So you have to be filter compatible between them. So you have to put a transition zone in that may be about say six inch minus material in between. Now on the upstream side, Particularly in high seismic zones, oftentimes there's a filter and a transition on the upstream side of your core. If it cracks, you could that material could be used as a crack stopper that could come in and fill that crack. So that's not always done, but um, there's not one size fits all, I think, is what you're going to dis discover for embankment dams. Here is the same kind of view as the last slide, except for this is a sloping uh, clay core, um, and, and a lot of the configurations depend on the permeability of what your clay, what that core is. If it's a little bit siltier, you may need a wider core. If it's clayier, you probably could get by with a with a thinner core. There is faced rock fill dams, so this upstream face uh, could be asphalt or concrete, and then you have filters that are downstream of that if it does crack. Um, and then there's uh, a couple of rock fill zones, and they typically the rock fill would increase in size as you go downstream to provide uh, strength and stability of the cross section. So what determines an embankment cross section? Well, local available materials, and that's why you're going to see if you if you look historically at, at, at cross sections and you created your own library or just went online, there is a huge range. Of, of cross sections and zonation, internal zonation. And why is that? It's because what the materials are available at the site. So when the dam was first built, they, they, they uh, actually, a lot of times they borrow out of the reservoir area uh, because then they create storage that way. Uh, and, you know, the modification projects will have their own local boral source typically. So you, you use material out of excavation as planned excavations, as well as from, from boral, and that's why You'll see a lot of different cross sections. I've already talked about loading conditions, static, flood, and seismic loading will uh, will really determine kind of the shape of that cross section. Economics have to come into play, uh, particularly with when you have a certain uh, budgetary restraints. Construction resources, uh, typically for a lot of dams, I mean, you want to make the uh, your features constructible and simple to to build. 
and, and try to make it so it was local resources and not have something that is a specialty item. Obviously, at times we have to have those, but if possible, uh, you would try to avoid that. The configuration of the existing embankment. So if you're trying to raise an embankment dam, depending on how that was configured, particularly with your core and how to tie into your core and then raise it, um, can determine what the cross section is as well. And designer preference. I mean, for me, it would be experience on looking at different cross sections and, and performance history of existing embankments, what has gone right and wrong, and to use those as part of the, of the precedence. Um, just very quickly, I wanted to uh, put this chart up that the people with the core probably have familiar with this. It came out of uh, EM 1156, but this just shows the, the uh, 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 the routine of, uh, of the process actually for, for dams within the core that this, this green outside loop uh, goes through its, its routine uh, work for, the, for uh, dam safety, for O&M inspections, um, some risk assessments, dam safety training, monitoring instrumentation. But if there's an issue that occurs with a dam, that's where you go through the center of the loop. So we would run, we would, from that, we would have performed a risk assessment to, to identify at least an initial one that there are some potential issues with that embankment. The IRRM is um, um, some uh, features that could be added, uh, interim risk reduction measures is what it stands for. So one of those would be to lower the pool. Um, so you take the head off for say, if it's an overtopping, you may wanna lower that down and keep it permanently lowered. You would then go into some more advanced studies maybe do some, uh, some site characterization work, some drilling and test pits and lab testing. And then from that, from after this issue evaluation study, you would determine if the, if the risk was still not tolerable, if you had to, to, uh, to do something and modify the dam. And that's when you go into a dam safety modification study, that you look at alternatives to remediate that dam, to get it within guidelines and, and from a risk standpoint, and then uh, from there, uh, our implementation phase would be design and construction. So these are some factors here wrapping this up um, that um, for design and construction factors for embankment dams, we went over stability, seepage, filter compatibility, settlement and consolidation uh, all have to come into play with any embankment design, dam design. Upstream slope protection for, for wave runup um, as well as I talked about the use of uh, constructive materials and local materials. And we always talk about two lines of defense, multiple lines of defense for any embankment dam. So if you have your filter on your downstream core, you put a drain material adjacent to that. If that filter cracks or if it gets overwhelmed with flow, you have the drain material immediately downstream of that that can collect that. So that's why those two features go hand in hand. Construction risks certainly have to come into play for the core, we do construction risk during the modification study, as well as about halfway through frontal design. You don't wanna select an alternative that has too high of a construction risk. These are the same uh, key takeaways that we started with here. So um, that's all I had for the introductions.